Hi guys, in this video we are going to talk about multicollinearity and variance inflation factor. So what is collinearity, also called multicollinearity? Well, we are in the realm of regression, either multiple linear regression or also generalized linear models with multiple x variables. So collinearity or multicollinearity is essentially a problem of matrix inversion. For example, recall that in linear regression, the estimate for the coefficients, the beta hat, using OLS or maximum likelihood is equal to this expression over here. And this involves inverting this matrix over here. So if the columns of X are linearly dependent, meaning there is some perfect linear relations that for some X column, we can express it as a linear combination of all the other Xs, all the other columns. Um, this would also be true to X transpose X, and then we could not invert this matrix anymore. And this is because this will be a singular matrix. So if this will be P times P uh, dimensions, uh, the rank will be less than P and we can't invert the matrix. And this is called perfect multicollinearity. And the problem also occurs for GLMs. Um, I have a series about GLMs. If you also watch that, then you can remember that using newton Raphson or Fisher scoring, we have to invert the Fisher information matrix, which is this. And W is a diagonal matrix, so it doesn't affect uh, the linear structure between the X columns. So if X has columns that are linearly dependent, then this thing will also have uh, columns that are linearly dependent and, and we won't be able to invert the matrix. Okay, so this was perfect multicollinearity. A less severe case is where there's almost a linear relationship. And what happens here is that slight changes to the design matrix. So let's say uh, a value of X changes from one to 1.1 or something like that. This can cause severe changes to the inverted matrix. And as such to the beta estimators, because we said the beta estimator is just this thing. So I want to give you a concrete example. Suppose that this was our uh, matrix, our X matrix. And notice that the third column here is almost exactly the first plus the second. There's only this point one that was added, which prevents it from being perfect multicollinear. Yeah. So if we invert this matrix, we get this result. Okay. But suppose we change the values a little bit. Suppose that the real values were this, but uh, there were measurement errors or something like that. So here it's almost the exact same matrix, slight changes. So here, instead of one, I put 0 0.98. Here, instead of one, I put 1.1. And here, instead of 1.1, I put 1.01. And notice how much it affects the inverse, okay? So before it was in the 200s, now it's in the 2000s. So it's almost a factor of 10 to the inverted matrix. What this means is that the matrix is ill-conditioned. It's almost singular. It's not singular, but it's almost singular. And of course, this doesn't happen if the matrix is not almost linearly dependent. So for example, this matrix, there's no problem of linearly dependence, okay? The columns here are definitely not linearly dependent of each other. This is the inverse of that. If now I make the same changes as before, nothing happens, like there's barely a change to the inverted matrix. Okay, so why is this a problem? What it means, it means that the estimates of beta are not so reliable. So small changes to the data could give us completely different estimators. More fundamentally, what are the interpretation of the beta's coefficients? So the way we interpret them is that uh, once we have our estimate, for example, for beta one, then it means that y will change beta one hat units when we change x1 and we hold all the other x's constant. But this is not possible or not necessarily possible if there's a relation between the x's. Because if we change x1 by one, maybe it will also change the other x's. And if there's a linear dependence between them, then changing x1, maybe, maybe x2 is equal to x1 plus x3. So if we change x1, x2 will immediately change. So we cannot keep x2 and x3 constant and only change x1, yeah. And another thing that happens is that the standard errors of coefficients, they become larger. So this means that we have a higher p-value, which means we might not detect a significant variable is actually significant. So in linear models, this is our variance, right? Our variance matrix. And if this is really huge, then this will be our variance for uh, beta one, 
this will be our variance for beta two, this will be our this will be our variance for beta three. They are very huge, and we might not get that the p value is significant. And the same applies for GLMs. So so asymptotically using properties of maximum likelihood estimators, this will be the variance. It's the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. And here again, we have that XTX minus one, which will blow up if we have multicollinearity. So how can we detect multicollinearity? Well, there are a few ways. Uh, one way is to try and protrude the data and see if the coefficients change drastically. Another way is finding the conditional number of the matrix and seeing if it's too high. And usually a rule of thumb is above 30 is too high. So for example, for the aid matrix over here, which has almost perfect multicollinearity, the condition number is 5,363. For the C matrix, which is not collinear at all, uh, the condition number is three. And for simple bivariate relationship, we can look at the correlation matrix. So the matrix that says the correlation between x1 and x2, x1 and x3, etc., or at pair scatter plots uh, and see if the correlation is high. And here again, a rule of thumb is maybe 0 0.9 or 0 0.95. But again, this doesn't capture more complex relationships. So it doesn't have to be that the linear dependence is only between two variables. It could be that x1 depends on x2, x3, and x4. And this won't be captured by necessarily by the correlation matrix. And there are also other methods. The problem with all of these methods is that they don't really identify the main axes that are causing the problem. So which predictor or independent variables are causing the problem? But a method that does tell you what is the source of the problem is the variance inflation factor. So what you do in a variance inflation factor is you take each column by itself and you treat it as if it's the y and you regress all the other x's onto it. So xj, you say, well, how much are x1 till xj minus one, xj plus one and xp? So all of the other x's except xj, how much do they explain xj? So you do these regression, these linear regressions, and then for each of these regression, you get the r squared uh, score, the coefficient of determination. And the VIF is just one over one minus of that. Okay, so since R squared is between zero and one, then VIF is always greater than one, right? Because uh, when R squared is zero, VIF will be uh, one. And when R squared is one, VIF will be infinity. And you do this for each variable. And the larger the VIF, the worse the multicollinearity of that particular variable, making it a good candidate for removal. So how much is too high? There are different rules for that, but usually above five is problematic and above 10 is, is really problematic. And by the way, why is it called variance inflation factor? Well, under certain assumptions, this is the factor by which the variance of a perfectly orthogonal design matrix, where the x1 is completely orthogonal to all the other x's. It's the opposite of linearly dependent. It's each axis is like a different uh, dimension in space. So if we have this kind of a design matrix, this kind of an X matrix, and then you introduce linearity, then this is the factor by which you increase the variance. Okay, so how can we show that? Well, this is the variance of beta one, right? It's this matrix and we take only the first element in the first row and first column of this matrix. But if we use sure complement, uh, we can get that this element is actually equal to this thing over here. So we can divide the X matrix to X1, which is just the first column, and X minus one, which is all the other columns. And then we can get that it's actually equal to that using the sure complement, which is an identity in linear algebra. Now, if the design matrix is orthogonal, the second factor is zero, right? Because this is zero, because this is zero, this is the identity matrix, and this is zero. So everything here is eventually zero. And we get that the variance is just equal to this. Regardless of that, Notice that this thing over here is exactly the RSS of the regression of all the other x's onto x1, right? So if we denote um, x1 by y, this is the definition of the RSS. So what we have here is that this is the RSS1. This is the RSS 
of x1 is the dependent variable and all the other x's are the independent variable. And we know that RSS, the residual sum of square, is just equal to the total sum of squares times one minus the r squared. Why just divide by this, move everything around, and you get that r squared is equal to one minus RSS divided by TSS, which is the definition of r squared. Now, if we further assume that x1 is centralized, it's demeaned. So we took away the mean of x1 and we demeaned all the variables basically, then the expectation of x1 is just zero. And then the total sum of squares is just the x1 transpose x1, right? It's just the sum of all the elements of x1 squared. So we get that the variance is equal to this thing, but this thing is uh, equal to RSS. Okay, so we can write it like this, but the RSS is equal to TSS times one minus R squared. TSS is equal to this. This is R one minus R squared. And we said this will be the variance if the matrix was orthogonal. And this is the inflation factor that we are um, adjusting because it's not orthogonal, because there's uh, some dependence between the variables. Now that we assumes numerical predictors. If we have dummy or indicator variables, this may complicate things. And I will leave a link in the description to a paper that kind of elaborates on this. So how do we solve the problem of multicollinearity? We can drop variables of i v uh, as they contain low information. So we can drop the highest v, then test for uh, v again, drop the second highest, etc. We can try to obtain more data, and then maybe our collinearity problem will uh, disappear. We can constrain the coefficients, maybe. Ridge linear regression will is an example of how to do it. It forces the betas to be small. We can project the data into new space where there isn't a problem anymore. So, so we have a problem of linear dependence, but if we project uh, to a subspace uh, using principal component regression or partial least squares regression, this problem might disappear. Or we can just accept the situation and do nothing. Um, we can say, this is how the data is. Future data will also be generated like this. Um, the problem, the multicollinearity doesn't affect prediction. So the predictions are the same. This means that the SS residuals and the sum of square regression aren't affected. R square and F aren't affected. And as a side note, um, a possible sign of multicollinearity, again, going to detection, um, is that is that you have a high R squared, but non-significant covariates. This is one possible sign for multicollinearity, but it doesn't have to be that this happens and you can still have multicollinearity. So overall, prediction is not a problem. Uh, the predictions are not affected. It's not okay for inference for the variables that are linearly dependent with each other. So if we have some group of variables that are linearly dependent with each other, we can trust the inference, the beta coefficients, and is it significant or not for those variables. But for other variables that are not uh, linearly dependent with the others, the inference works fine. OK, and one way to show this is I took another example. So x1 and x2 are almost linearly dependent, but they are completely different than x3. This is the example I took. We can see that here we have relatively high uh, values on this submatrix for x1 and x2, but nothing for x3. So the variance of beta of 3 will be low. And if we change here a little bit the this matrix, we see that the values change mostly for the submatrix. This element here, which corresponds to the variance of uh, beta 3, is still very low. And we can see that the condition number is not as low as three, but is not as high as 5,363. Okay, so this is kind of a mixed problem where you have uh, a subgroup of covariates that are linearly dependent, but other group is okay. You can do, you can trust the inference on the group that is not linearly dependent. So let me switch into R. Um, this is the library where you can compute the VIF. It's in the car library. This code is just a matrix inversion, and I already showed you uh, all of these matrix inversions. So I'll skip that. This is the conditional number. And now I want to add a simulation. So let's say I have 1,000 observation, x1 and x2 completely independent. And x3 is linearly dependent of x1, but almost. It's not exactly. I'm adding a little bit of noise. So it's not perfectly linearly dependent. 
And then Y is just some combination of X1, X2, and X3 and some noise. If we plot X1 and X3, we can see it's almost completely linearly dependent and it has a correlation of 0 0.9995. If we fit the model and we look at the summary, we see the coefficient of the intercept is quite okay. The coefficient of X2 is also quite okay. The coefficient of X1 is quite off. It was one and now it says it's 0 0.5 almost. And the coefficient of X3 is also not as good. It, it was one, but it says 1.26. And also uh, X1 does not come out significant. It has a relatively large standard error and the p-value is insignificant. Um, X3 does come out significant, but not as much as X2, uh, which really shouldn't be a reason for that because X2 and X3 contribute to the model just the same, right? And if we look at the VIF, we see that the V for X2 is almost one, so there's no problem with X2, but for X1 and X3, they're almost identical and they are huge. They're 1,153. And just to drive the point home even further, I'm going to run these simulations in a loop and change the level of noise um, for X3. How much is it um, dependent on X1? So at first I will have a lot of noise, then I will lower it, lower it, lower it until it's almost completely identical to two times X1. Okay, so if I run this and I wanna plot the correlations. So for a standard deviation of five, the correlation is approximately 0 0.6. For a standard deviation of two, the correlation is 0 0.88 or something like that. For a standard error of one, the correlation is almost, the correlation is 0 0.97, et cetera. It goes almost to one. And look what happens to the beta. So beta ones, um, we see that for the first few, it stays around one, it doesn't change, but for, 0 0.01 and 0 0.001, so for correlations of almost one, it's even outside of the scale. We can't see it in the scale. So it's completely off, right? And if we look at it, yeah, it's 12 and minus nine. So completely off from what it really was, which was one, right? And if we look at beta twos, here we don't have this problem. The beta twos, it's almost exactly one, no matter what. We said that X2 has no linear dependence on X1 or X3, so it's safe. Uh, we don't have any problem with that. What about the beta three? The same problem as beta one, right? So for the first few, it's more or less okay. It's more or less in the value of one, but then for the really high correlations, for the correlations that are almost up to one, so very small standard error, very small noise added to that two X1, it's completely off of the charts. Let's see how much it is. It's minus four and six. Yeah. So I hope this explains more about multicollinearity and variance inflation factor. I hope you enjoyed this video and see you in the next one.